Sports. Weather's been awful. Yeah. Yeah, Gary. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else see the conjunction? Where were you guys? Oh, Lake Plaza. Five minutes. Maryville Road. Where else, Rob? An occultation of that conjunction? That's what I got too. Yeah. In fact, yeah, I've got. It. In fact, I, it, at the beginning of our observation slides, I've, uh, I was out in Victoria in uh, October, I guess it was, and I got a very, um, very unusual conjunction. It'll, I'll show it to you when we when we get to it. All right. So, Chuck, are you ready to roll? I think we'll get started with our business meeting right away. Good evening. I'm your president for the next five minutes or so. Um, welcome to our annual general, general meeting. Uh, since we're incorporated, this is a legal thing we have to go through. So, I'll go right off the bat. First thing, uh, this will be our agenda for it. I won't read it, I'll just let you look at it. Basically, I'll go through this as fast as possible because there's a lot of interesting stuff tonight, besides this. So, first thing we have to do is approve last year's minutes. Now, the minutes were up on the table in the back, and I'm sure everyone's taken the time to read them all. So, if I may have a motion to accept the meeting, uh, the minutes from last year's uh, the annual meeting, December 7th, 2007, minutes of the meeting. I need an... First of all, uh, okay, we'll get Paul. April Jenkinson uh, yeah. and Paul. And Paul will... Paul second again? Yeah. All in favor? Say yo. Yo. Carried. One other way. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so this is my report. And the uh, co my copy is up in the back, and I'm sure uh, I, uh, if everybody would take the time to read it, there was a lot of nice things happened this year. But what I will do, I'll just... Uh, do the highlights just to be sure that um, uh, we, we cover everything, I hope. I'll just get this out of the way. So first of all, um, boom, 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 let's see what we got here. We could all read that. We're the uh, second largest in Canada, soon to be largest, I hope. But uh, actually, I uh, am very pleased and thankful of the expertise we have in this uh, uh, center. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be uh, your president, and um, boy, uh, it was an experience I loved. Thank you very much. Monthly meetings. Um, whoops. Here we go. Uh, normally, the, uh, the uh, attendance is around 150, which is great. Uh, and my personal thanks to Brian. Where are you, Brian? Uh, he's, he's, hey, he's way in the back there. Brian, well done, I'll tell you. Uh, you took over uh, for me. Did your change, and uh, we had a great time. Uh, Brian, we loved it. Thank you very much for your two years as meeting chair. And another thank, thank you for the meetings is uh, Ann and uh, Art Fraser. They've been here every month, and every meeting you've had your coffee and cookies and great conversation out there. Al and Ann, thank you very much. <clears throat> So we had a whoops, Cheryl. Well, where are we here? Make sure we go. We had a great annual dinner. A beautiful speaker uh, about the moon, uh, Dr. Stope, and uh, special thanks to Paul Harrison for organizing the uh, uh, dinner itself at the Algonquin College. I'll tell you the menu and the uh, ambiance is great there. And uh, without objection, we'll be going there for uh, a lot of future dinners. It, uh, we've never been disappointed. And Brian, again, thank you. You organized the speaker and had uh, all the, uh, uh, basically everything for getting the speaker here, getting him a place to sleep and eat and back home safely. Thank you very much. It was, it was a great evening. We had a great time. <laughs> and most of, most of my reports about Brian McCullough because on the lunar eclipse uh, we had last February, at minus 20 below, Brian was the... Uh, was the uh, staunch uh, leader for this to get us out there. We had telescopes and this, the uh, museum says we had over 200 people. And if we, they had shown up without the RASC background, it would have been a disaster, but thanks to Brian, it worked. Hey, yeah, great. It was like minus 25 that night too. Yeah, it was cold toes. I know. <laughs> 
We had another successful astronomy day here at the museum. We had meteorites, uh, meteor craters. We had telescopes, daytime observation. Mike, thank you very much for, for your uh, help as well. Uh, uh, all, all the guys that come up with their telescopes, uh, daytime planet observ observing was, was fantastic, and of course the nighttime uh, star party. Uh, uh, the museum says we had 844 people here in the daytime and 180 people attending the star party at night. Uh, success, uh, great, thank you very much members, it was, uh, it was a great, uh, great evening. We have a, a new uh, public outreach person, Mike uh, Mogadam. He's not here tonight, but he's uh, been very keen starting to set up uh, star parties and so on. Unfortunately, uh, Ottawa weather did its thing on him and we had to cancel a bunch, but um, Mike, uh, keep up the good work. We're looking forward to a lot of stuff. Uh, December 21st is going to be our winter solstice uh, star party here at the museum. Uh, again, uh, uh, let's, let's get some telescopes out here because the museum is depending on us and uh, we have to celebrate the sol solstice anyway. Linda and Rolf, another great summer uh, picnic, uh, annual picnic for us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we always enjoy those. Unfortunately, I missed it this year, but uh, yeah, it was, it was great. Um, Al Seaman running the FLO. Uh, again, Al has been our staunch uh, leader out there and uh, man, full speed ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chris. <laughs> Smart Scope. Um, uh, Doug George gave a great report. It's in the uh, President's report. I won't uh, dwell on it, but uh, we will get it going. Uh, Richard Kixie and Estelle Rother, uh, Library. Uh, man, oh man, our library is going full speed ahead. We love it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, yes. Our website, uh, this is not a trivial operation. Uh, uh, Richard McDonald had taken it from, uh, from Storm uh, onto our new ISP, uh, brought everything over, everything's working full speed without a hiccup. Uh, I played with the software for a while and I fully realized the, uh, qu the magnitude of expertise and labor that's, uh, that's required to make this thing happen. Uh, Richard, thank you very much, it was, it was great, great. <laughs> Treasure, I'll tell you, anybody that wants to be treasure. <laughs> but Hans took it over uh, and he's doing a great job. We finally finished our, uh, our full audit. Uh, Paul, I'm looking forward to a lot of decisions coming up because of this audit. Paul's going to be our next president uh, in a few minutes. Um, but Hans, uh, uh, full thank you for everything you're doing here. There he is in the back there, man oh man, I'll tell you, the work you're doing, Hans, thank you very much. <clears throat> Just to uh, wrap up, um, this year, Paul Commission Observer of the Year, Gary Boyle, what a job you've done. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, Paul? No, Mike? Not oh, not yet? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Whoop, whoop. I'm just going to, uh, do you want me to announce it now? No, no nope. awards. <laughs> okay. And uh, fi I just want to mention that we did a special center appreciation award to Deborah Saravallo. Uh, she's not here tonight. She's down uh, south uh, looking at, um, uh, well, she's getting warm, that's for sure, don't it? And P her and Peter are down there uh, with her business. A uh, great time. I just want to finish off. Where are we here? Positions. Okay. Uh, this is me. Well, it's 1970. Where are we here? Is this, this, I don't know if it is or not. I know I. I'm over there somewhere. Basically, this is 1970-ish, 75-ish or so on. I'm there in the crowd, and I just want to mention, 30 years later, here we are. Uh, we have, since then, since that picture's been taken, we've discovered over 150 alien planets, uh, human genome, Mars rovers, hydro carbon lakes on Titan, mapping Venus and Mercury, Titalic, uh, fossil fish with legs predicted and found by the science of evolution, ice volcanoes on, on Enceladus, uh, mapping the microwave background, gamma ray bursts, and we've got new words, URL, HTTP, GPS, HTML. <laughs> <laughs> got a new meaning for windows. <clears throat> That's 30 years ago. Okay, here we are last year at the annual general meeting, and I'm just wondering where we were going to be 
at the annual general meeting of 2038 where my picture is going to be. Now what kind of si what science are we going to have from, from what I showed you in the 70s to now and from now 30 years in the future? It's, it's, it's just going to be fascinating. But it's going to be science that's going to bring us there. And I'm proud to say that the statement of our center published supports the scientific method and reads in part, the RASC Ottawa Center and its publication will not promote any non-scientific explanation of the nature of the universe. The complete position statement may be seen on our website and I urge you all to uh, have a look at it. So, presentation wise, president wise, I'm done. Thank you very much. I had a blast. Thank you. And Hans, uh, Treasury Report. This is the guy that's done the work, I'll tell you. Hans, uh, Hans Bauer, I'll, man. Thank you for taking it on. I really appreciate it, sincerely. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Hans Brower. Here has been a, a busy year, and I thank Steve and Norse for taking me through it at the first of the, at the beginning. So we'll start with the Treasury Report. Um, the first uh, next slide is that uh, Mr. Potter has uh, completed the, uh, the audit for, uh, from last year. And uh, up front here, I have a copy of his audit letter. And it's displayed here as well. Um, he gave us a, a clean bill of health, but he did have four, rec four recommendations. I just want to highlight uh, two of those. Uh, one has to do with the, the, the uh, fixed assets that we have in our society and our center. And he uh, recommends that we could continue to, to review our assets and, and do what you do at home. What do we do at home? We take pictures of what we have and store them in a safe place just in case we, uh, uh, something happens to them so we have a, a proper record. The, the other, uh, maybe we'll go to the next slide. I think the recommendations are on that. Oh, no. oh that's okay. The, the, the fourth recommendation is concerning smart scope. Um, uh, Al Seaman was so generous to take us uh, to SmartScope to have a look because this was part of the asset review. And his uh, fourth recommendation states, use it or lose it. And, uh, I think that's going to be addressed uh, very shortly. And also with Doc George in, in uh, part of the team, you will make it. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to actually see it in operation. Um, that is, uh, so for this year, oh no, that will come in a second. So we'll go to the next slide, uh, Chris. The financial statements. The, uh, if you go to the next slide, here we go. This is the, the income statement. A, a general comment uh, that I'd like to make is this is the first year since 2004 that things are kind of stabilized. We, we don't have any influences from uh, GA credits or some additional revenues or some additional expenses. So it has stabilized. You see the revenue has dropped down a little bit. Uh, there, there are two reasons for that, but the main reason is that the annual life membership grant, we, we don't receive that anymore from the national office uh, due to some uh, CRA uh, policies and guidelines. Well, I work at CRA, maybe we should have a talk with them. <laughs> um, also, uh, Al Seaman is still working on the uh, financials for uh, FLO. Um, there, there is some more money there, but not, won't significantly uh, change the, these, these numbers. On the expenses side, um, it's kind of odd that on the operating cost you, you see uh, last year 14,000, this year 24,000, and the reason is we, we received a, a large uh, credit from Carleton University concerning the GA in 2006, and that really throws it off. But if you look at the financial statements on the front here, you see four years of history. Back in 2004, it was very close to the 24,000, and that's what I mean, it's, it's kind of stabilizing. Um, income statement, income, well if you take the depreciation away we'll see that we have a slight loss of $1,659 and that, that is a, a bit of concern uh, for me and I'll, I'll address that in, in a few minutes in, uh, in, in a slide coming up. So we go to the balance sheet Chris please. Um, the, the change in assets is mainly due to the depreciation that we calculate, calculate in there and, and the liabilities, uh, no, sorry, the, uh, the retained earnings uh, went down a little bit uh, because of the loss we had. All right. Uh, so we go to the next slide. Okay. Here I'm going to address some of the uh, these topics here. 
the financial viability of the, the center. So uh, as I mentioned, we operate a small loss uh, due to not receiving the annual life membership grant. The council is looking at that, see how we can uh, rectify that. We are a charity, uh, and so we, we will be announcing a statement on that issue and see how we can uh, correct that. The uh, Calgary Center has, a, has addressed that in a certain way. Maybe we want to have a look at that, and that's under discussion. Um, also, the membership, as mentioned before, is at 404. It's, it declined slightly, not significant, but it does affect your, your membership uh, revenue stream. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we, we had a slight loss, so we're looking at some cost cutting measures. One cost cutting measure, I have proposed five. One has been completed by Richard McDonald. That was great. That's an annual saving of about $350. And we're looking at some uh, other opportunities to cut some cost. So outlook for this this year, though, is that uh, things are, are, are in good shape, especially as when we decide to do the vote on some of the other cost and measures. And uh, some of them will be put to, to you because we want to make sure that uh, well, we work for you and make sure that you get the, the benefits of being a member to this, this center. Um, also, the cost cutting measures will mean that there will be no need to consider any sort of center surcharge to the membership due, so we'll keep that uh, stable. Number two, profit loss. Uh, as mentioned before, we had a slight loss, excluding the depreciation, and as I mentioned, the, the actions are on the way to correct that. Investments, um, the, I'm not sure if that was on there. We, we do have a reserve in GICs, uh, and, 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 and those reserves will be used for uh, investments in smart scope we might have to do. Uh, International Year of Astronomy, we might want to take some projects on that will require we'll be using some of those funds. Um, FLO expenses, as I mentioned, uh, part of the expenses I do have, part I don't have, it's uh, Al Seaman is working on that, so uh, we'll, we'll get a full report from him a little bit later. Smart scope, well, as I mentioned before, uh, has been addressed by, uh, by Chuck as well. Uh, the auditor had a comment about that, use it or lose it. He was extremely impressed, though, when we were down there. It's just an unbelievable uh, structure that's out there. A lot of effort went into it. And as I understand, it, wouldn't t it won't take much effort to get that going. And it might need a small investment to, to do that. Um, astronauts, there is one cost cutting measure we want to look at. Astronauts, as we know today, it's under discussion. We have four options to change this slightly. And, uh, and you'll be informed about that, where that's going to go. Donations. Um, a little while ago, I thought donations went down until I did a further analysis. Uh, yes, it went down a little bit, but we also had some donations for our library that will be uh, that, uh, that are included in this year's statement. So, um, but I want to thank to those who did donate the money, and tax receipts will be forthcoming. Um, questions? because I'm getting to the close to the end here. Is there any uh, questions about what I've mentioned so far? Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, Rob, I get to, Rob, maybe get Rob's question, uh, take the question first. So the, the question was that the uh, the slide, the income statement slide, mentioned a. Yeah, that's just a little bit the way it's presented. So the revenue is 15. Operating cost is uh, well, those those three combined gives you a net income of 11,000. Well, and the. A loss of, of eleven thousand one hundred ninety-two minus the depreciation. So, what's the part you? Wait, because the net income includes the depreciation. So, if you take the depreciation away from the eleven thousand, then you get your 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 net cash outflow out of our center of uh, sixteen hundred fifty-nine. So, basically. Kind of sixteen hundred fifty nine dollars poorer than we were last year. Paul, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes, I wanted to know just approximately how much more is needed for the smart scope to get it going. Uh, a business plan is being prepared by Doc George. I'm of the understanding, unless there's some recent information came up. Uh, the, in the president's report, we have a paragraph that explains it. 
Is that right? Okay. So, so I, I don't know those information. Yeah. I'll get it to you. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be writing the check as soon as I write. I'll let you know. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. From the, uh, from the auditor, two of them weren't arrest warrants or something. Right? No, just, just, you'd like to see some additional notes at the bottom, the financial statement. I got that in there, and the financial statements are up front. All right. Um, so the financial statements are available at the front. Uh, now we go to the, mo the motion to approve the, the statements. Um, this is where I get a little shaky in my shoes. Chris, how does this work? Uh, we need someone to propose a motion. Brian has done that. We need someone to second that motion. And oh. Stephen has done that. Oh. Then we need a second that emotion? Uh, <laughs> Stephen Nurse has seconded the motion. And then we just need a show of hands of those who uh, approve the motion. Oh, lots. Show of hands for those who are <laughs> against the motion. It's carried unanimously. OK, thank you. Then we have one more slide after this. It's an easy one. Uh, Mr. Potter has gracefully uh, accepted uh, to work with me again on the auditing this year's financial statement that we just closed. And so there we go. We need the motion to approve the appointment of David, Mr. We David have, Potter. Rick Wagner has put a motion. It's been seconded by Paul. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So this is part of my fame at the podium here. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so, so the loan library is uh, still in existence. We still have lots of scopes. Uh, we uh, loan them out to members at a cost of $10 a month. Uh, here is the, uh, the inventory we currently have. I've put uh, numbers of uh, rentals uh, this year on the left and from last year is in brackets just to compare to show how much uh, use the members are getting out of this stuff. Uh, so we've actually made uh, rental income this year and last year. In the first two years and probably a decade we've actually made a rental income. Um, we've also sold some of the older equipment and we're, we're constantly uh, looking at the inventory and trying to keep it maintained and keep it up to date for the members. Uh, we do get donations from time to time and sell older equipment to try and uh, keep things up to date. Uh, this year we purchased an uh, ultra high contrast uh, nebular filter uh, and I was actually using it on the uh, 8 inch daub up in the upper left corner. We've actually got that one at the back of the room right now. It's going out to a member. I was using that up on Momagantique at the start of this month and it was uh, really nice. I got the dumbbell nebula and the ring nebula and it was uh, just jumping out with the, with the actual filter. That's a really nice scope, the 8 inch. The 10 inch uh, the big red one on the, on the right there, I think we're going to try and get rid of that because it's, uh, the optics aren't very good. Although it has been used a lot last year, uh, we really couldn't get it to focus well without stopping it down to be a 4-inch, and it's very big for a 4-inch. Uh, in terms of eyepieces, we're short of high magnification eyepieces, so I'm going to be looking at uh, maybe getting a couple more of those to spread around the, uh, with, the, with them. And I've also, uh, for educational use, we We'll give them away free to members if they want to take them out to uh, school groups or things like that. And that's, that's definitely one of our goals here. So uh, if you're interested in using any of these scopes, feel free to, to give me an email. I'll bring them out to the meetings and you can, you can play with them and learn about all the different types of scopes that we have. So thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, it was my great pleasure at the uh, at the uh, dinner to uh, introduce our uh, uh, Paul Commission Observer of the Year for 2008. Uh, it was close running between a, a couple of people, uh, but I uh, chose Gary Boyle this year. How uh, oh, does he do that? Right. Uh, selected Gary Boyle for uh, a bit of work that he did. What I thought was above and beyond with his astro casting, where he was sharing his uh, observations. Uh, uh, with as wide an audience as possible. So, Gary, uh, congratulations on your Observer of the Year, Paul Commission Observer of the Year. Oh, you're right here. There he is right there. Okay. Now, that's going to be no slide because Yahoo Live has now ended broadcasting as of Wednesday. So now it's going to be through Ustream, which is still a link on my site, so stay tuned. Okay. No more, no more Yahoo. Nice again, Brad. All right, okay. Paul? Oh. <laughs> 
fell asleep there. <laughs> uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, to award the uh, Astronauts Article of the Year to um, a member that's been with, well, he's, he used to be the, uh, oh, the meeting chair of about two years ago, I guess, eh? So, yeah. Um, and uh, to Mike Earl. Oh, there, there it goes. Um, for his, um, his, Jul his uh, article in the uh, July-August edition. It was about the uh, Hickson, Hickson, yeah, Hickson uh, 50 and the question of magnitude. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't have the plaque here with me. Um, well, I, I just got a new fireplace insert at my house, so I was, you know, I, I needed something to, to test it out with, so uh, oh. It burnt really nicely, uh, but no, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll give you the pack uh, probably sometime in the new year. I guess you're going to be here February. I guess. Okay, we'll um, we'll give you a pack then. It's it. We do have one. I, I <laughs> trust you. I didn't know. I didn't burn it. Hey, congratulations. Anyway, uh, have we taken. Uh, okay, that's it. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Thanks. Thanks very much, Paul, and th congratulations, Mike. Uh, well done. Okay. Um, Deborah Suravalo, uh, we gave her a ver an appreciation award in October, and the reason we did that is because she's off on business and she's still there uh, with, uh, with Peter down in, uh, in California, flying the airplane down and so on. So we, we gave the award early because of that, but uh, Deborah, uh, the reason we gave her the, the award, I, I mentioned that between my role as president, uh, we just got off the annual, annual general meeting, and then next year we're going to have the International Year of Astronomy. And uh, Deborah is basically the prime person for both of those events. So uh, she did a tremendous amount of work and is still doing a tremendous amount of work and will do a tremendous amount of work for us. So she's well deserving of that reward. And Brett, Deborah, if you can hear us, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, we went through the election again. Deborah was uh, prime for uh, getting uh, the uh, elections completed. The nominations, uh, you can read them all there. And uh, we did not have any more nominations, so there's no votes required. So positions acclaimed. So congratulations to our new uh, council members and uh, to the new president, <laughs> Paul Harrison over there. Thank you very much, Paul. And, whoops, here we go. Appointed positions, I'll just let you uh, peruse those. Um, uh, public outreach, uh, Mike, as I mentioned before, light pollution, Gary, and so on. These uh, positions, uh, again, they're not trivial. There is a substantial amount of work that goes into each one, and I sincerely appreciate the effort that everyone on the council and these uh, positions take uh, to make things happen for our center. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Brian? Of course, one position that's not on there, not as an appointed position, but uh, someone who carries a lot of the weight for every one of our meetings is, uh, is Chris Terran. Yes. Uh, putting, uh, put the program together each time and uh, uh, you can throw all the technical worries on, in that corner. That means you can also throw the technical blame that way. Right? Yes, <laughs> for right? sure. So he does a lot of, I mean, he's doing a lot of uh, work. Yes. Yes, and, and Chris uh, additionally is our secretary. Uh, he looks after basically the nuts and bolts of how this place runs. So virtually every council meeting, uh, before uh, I propose anything, I say, Chris, is this okay to do? <laughs> so I get uh, the okie okay from Chris before anything proceeds, and I'll tell you, uh, uh, we sincerely appreciate it. Brian and I, uh, we know as meeting chairs, and of course Mike, past meeting chairs, uh, uh, Chris is always behind us helping us out. So the worst thing that a president does during a meeting is says, okay, what's other business? Anything not on the agenda? Anybody have any other business they'd like to uh, discuss? Yes, sir. I wanted to know what that standing cup decision from the, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, AGM this year. Oh, that, um, 
the AGM uh, basically had a hockey theme. And uh, uh, the, the guys running it, that actually did a great job. They're all hockey coaches. And they had the whistle, so they made sure things happened. Uh, when the brakes were over, the whistle went, get back in there, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was a great AGM. Anything else? Why don't you create a position for him? For? <laughs> So, so in other words, make Chris do more work. I don't know. <laughs> He's doing enough for us already. I'll tell you. <laughs> there you go. Hey, we're all done. I want the position and the salary now. We should have a hand for Chris's wife too, since a lot of times stay away from home on on what he does. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Astronomer's <laughs> widow. Of course, all the wives are saying, thank goodness for Friday nights. <laughs> Oops, did I say that out loud? <clears throat> okay, uh, motion to adjourn. Rick? Second? April. April. All in favor? Yes. yes. Rock and roll. Robert. Chair, you're on. <laughs> okay. All right, time to liven things up a little bit. Uh, Tim, can you uh, kill the lights, please? We're going to... Here we go. Here we go. It seems awfully static all of a sudden here, doesn't it? Uh, okay, pretty interesting lineup tonight. Uh, you can see there Gordon Webster, uh, one of our newer members, talking about uh, observing logs. That was one of the ideas that I had been trying to push forward was maybe get something in terms of a, a center observing log, but he's given us some good. He's going to give us some good ideas for types of uh, uh, observing log pages we can do. Uh, Glenn, we've got a, a nice uh, technical bit here, a little bit of uh, uh, equipment presentation, which is always uh, fun. Um, now that special presentation of mine, is that after the break? Exactly. That's going to happen after the break, so you don't want to miss that because there's going to be a little gifty handed out to everybody during the break. All right, so we want you all back after the break. 
And then uh, uh, closing off our presentations this evening is going to be Simon Hanmer uh, with a great uh, tour through the uh, the inner solar system. It's a, a virtual tour, and uh, I've had a chance to preview this with uh, with Simon about uh, I guess about a month and a half ago at your at your house there, and it's a, it's fantastic. All right, observations. Challenges and at the end, uh, uh, Chris and I have been working for the uh, the past while putting together uh, some kind of uh, interesting slides, key slides from the past two years of uh, of presentation. So uh, we'll get into that. All right, Gordon. Oh, uh, we've got uh, news. Yes, news first, and then uh, Tim. Are you ready for your auto skies in a couple minutes? All right, all right. Everybody see this? Did you guys see the conjunction this way? This is, <laughs> this is Los Angeles. I saw this on the net and I thought, well, if we could get a view like that, but uh, of course I don't think we want all the, uh, uh, the LP that, uh, that the LA group is putting up with. All right, so there's the moon with Venus and Jupiter. Okay, let's go on to the next one. All right, uh, interview with Heidi Marie Stephanation Piper, right? She was on the recent shuttle mission and do you remember, uh, do you remember what happened to her? Yep. Right, lost the toolkit. Okay, we've got a little clip here. Flight controllers are changing spacewalk plans for the shuttle Endeavour's visit to the International Space Station that after a crucial tool bag floated away during repair work. Um, we have a lost tool. The bag drifted away from astronaut Heidi Marie Stephanie Piper as she cleaned and lubed a joint on a wing of one of the station's solar panels. Well, it was uh, it was definitely not the high point of the EVA. It was somewhat disheartening to open up the bag and to realize that there was grease everywhere. And, um, and it seemed like the, every time I put my hand in the, in the bag to try to clean one piece, is I found more, more areas that had grease. And uh, in the process of doing that cleaning is when the bag came loose and floated away. And that was definitely very disheartening to see that float away. The tool bag was one of the largest items ever lost by a spacewalker. She and fellow astronaut Stephen Bowen were midway through the first of four spacewalks when the bag was lost. When I did see it floating away, and I started to judge how far away it was and thinking, well, can I reach and get it? And then I thought, no, that's, that would probably just make things worse, and the best thing to do would be to just let it go. Both astronauts finished the spacewalk in almost seven hours by sharing tools from Bowen's bag. He says it's just as much his mistake. You know, I closed up the bag as a final, and uh, I didn't go back and triple check everything. So. I'm, I'm just as guilty at this as uh, Heidi is. So. Stephanie Piper is the first woman to be assigned as lead spacewalker for a shuttle flight. She'll venture back out on the next two spacewalks for more joint repair work. Diane Kepley, The Associated Press. All right, so now we have another little bit <clears throat> that goes along with this because uh, Kevin Fetter in, uh, where is he, Brockville? In Brockville, uh, got, a, got an image uh, he, he knew the path of the uh, space station, so that would be the path of the missing toolkit. So uh, if we can run his video, here it comes in. That's the toolkit. <laughs> there it is. There. Now, uh, <clears throat> all right. Now, so we were able to get actually a, uh, a close-up view of this. Can we switch to that other? Here's we got a close-up of it going past here. Can we get that? There it comes. <laughs> <laughs> There it is. Do you want to see that again? <laughs> the stunning uh, resolution on that. All right. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> and the fireball, right? The fireball over uh, Edmonton that was observed mostly from Edmonton and uh, the prairies. Uh, just a sec here. That's a good one. That's it. Yeah, that's a good one. There are the hundreds of the course of a massive fireball. I don't know what happened to the sound on that. Somewhere between Alfred's Chancellor and Lloyd Minster on the border with Alberta. Sorry about the sound, but anyway, it's the video part that's the. Uh... The Edmonton station captured stunning images of the fiery object as it fell to Earth. Now let's take another look. A search for a landing site is now underway. All right. Yep. 
Oh, okay, you have to search it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this is the one that a lot of people may have seen. That's from the dashboard of a uh, police car. The dash cam. <laughs> Not too shabby. <coughs> All right. So we've got some, a uh, couple of images to show. Of course, now they've gone out to the strewn field. They've discovered the strewn field. There's a former auto center president, uh, Dr. Alan Hildebrand, and he's in charge of the uh, uh, Prairie Meteorite Recovery uh, Program. And this is one of his uh, grad students. Uh, is, is that Millie? Ellen Millie? Is that her name? Anyway, so they found, she, she, as they were driving by a pond there, she spotted these uh, objects sitting out on the pond, these black objects sitting out on a, on a light-colored pond. So they stopped, and sure enough, that's, that's the same uh, sample right there. If we go to the next one, they've also gone around and discovered a 13-kilogram uh, piece that chunked in and bounced out. That's it there. And I've just uh, read that they, I think there's another 11.5-kilogram piece that's been discovered. All right, I think that's... The last one. Anyway, um, yeah, Moon and Pleiades, uh, a lot of this stuff seems fairly old hat, but uh, the Moon and Pleiades, it's, a, it's an old favorite. This particular one looks like it's going to be really quite nice. If I can ever find the only nicer thingy. It's a, yeah. Yeah, it's a flat. It's this round button right there. Oh, geez, I should have known that. Anyway, uh, this should look really, really good. I didn't put together a, um, an animation of this because we're a little pressed for time tonight. But uh, this will give us a really, really nice occultation. So uh, enjoy it. Um, enjoy knowing what will be behind the clouds, because it should be really quite nice. Um, okay. Moon and time? What was that? Is that Zulu time or local time? No, that's, that's local time. Everything I do is local time, because I can never figure out Zulu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Moon and the Beehive, not quite as snazzy, but uh, still pretty nice. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar, the Beehive is a rather nice little cluster. Where the heck? There we go. It's a rather nice little cluster in a very hard in in, in an area that's kind of tricky to find from the city because Cancer, a friend of mine, has described it as a a uh, a monster that eats the sky, uh, which is not a bad def definition. In the city, it's a little rough. So uh, with this, this might give you a chance to uh, get yourself a good uh, a good latch on where the Beehive is compared to to Leo and Gemini. And uh, it's, a, it's pretty in its own right, but the beehive is well worth a, a quick peek through a small scope. So this will... Do you highlight what the beehive is? Yep. Okay. Patience. If I can ever get the silly thing. <laughs> there we go. Patience. Patience, my son. Use the force. Anyway, the beehive M44. Pretty, a very nice little target. Um, and it's very easy to find once you get the hang of it. Yep. Uh, where the heck am I here? All right. I keep pushing buttons until something happens. And that's, that's pretty much it, folks. Um, of course, you know the real Ottawa sky is the last thing we saw, which is this. Uh, that's, that's the main Ottawa sky coming up for God knows how long. So there you go, guys. Have fun. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, that's right. Oops, sorry. I knew it. I thought I... I, uh, I saw a blank sky after that. Uh, we have a nice little Kodak moment just in time for New Year's Eve. So... Um, Again, this isn't particularly spectacular in terms of snazzy, wondrous uh, sky thingies, but uh, it's it's really gorgeous. Uh, you might have noticed that we've had some lovely uh, planet stuff in the in the evening skies lately. If you ever get a chance to see an evening sky that isn't gray, Chris, where the heck are your buttons? On? Thank you. So we've got. Um, a nice little low pair of Mercury and Jupiter. This will be a nice opportunity for those of you who've had a little difficulty finding Mercury. It has this reputation of being impossible to find, which is utter rubbish. But from the city, it can be a little challenging because it's always low and buried in trees and stuff. So with nice bright Jupiter nearby, there's your chance to get a crack at Mercury. And of course, Venus and the Moon, uh, nobody ever has any trouble finding those, but Venus near the Moon is just always a nice little treat anyway. So I don't know why I said Kodak moment because nobody <coughs> uses Kodak film anymore, but at any rate. And I'm pretty sure, my, I don't think my feeble mind has, uh, that's uh, oh, that's it. Okay, I'm really done this time. Okay, bye. Okay, thanks, Tim. All right, Gordon Webster, come on up with our astronomical observing log. Okay, we have any light? A light, yeah. There you go. And there's a... I want a pointer thing. Okay, good. Well, Gumby is going to be a hard act to follow, but I'll give it a try. <coughs> I've been observing now for about a year. 
And uh, when I was going through the process of trying to fi find a scope, Brian gave me a hand, and I ended up with an 8-inch daub. And he told me that I should be keeping a log and that I should be making sketches of what I saw. It was good advice, but even though I'm an artist, it was always a little intimidating and I sort of shied away from it at the beginning. But now I find that if I don't do at least one sketch, it seems like a wasted observing session. But the question was what to use as a logbook. There are none that I know of that are commercially available, and using a computer, it just didn't seem right. It didn't allow for sketching. The laptop I have is old enough to vote, and uh, spending the time to learn a, a new software package just didn't seem the right way to go. Paper and pencil, I understand, and everybody here I'm sure understands them as well, and it's easy to sketch. Okay. As for the sketching part, it's, it's pretty basic, but uh, even for the artistically challenged. The first book that I used was a, a Ben Fang sketchbook. It's also available from Hillary. Uh, Zeller stocks them. It's called a project sketchbook. It's a spiral bound uh, book with pages that are blank on the top half and they have lined, uh, a lined area for notes on the lower half. It seemed okay at first, but then the that big blank area at the top got pretty intimidating if you weren't filling it with sketches. It seemed like a waste of a good page. Also, my handwriting's a little messy and sometimes I like to, to rewrite things and that wasn't possible with that. So I wasn't happy with those. I played in the internet for a while and I found there's several different types of log, log pages available out there. Most of them were asking for more technical information than I was prepared to deal with. And the sketching areas were either too large and ill-defined. I think we have a slide here. Hmm? Yep, okay. Yeah. So they were either too large and ill-defined or they were too small and too, and too many of them. Should be another one there. Yeah. Okay, now these are from a, a place called, and I'm not sure on the pronunciation, Cigarro Astronomy Club out of Arizona. Saguaro? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, but uh, there are a couple more of those, and they still didn't seem right, so I decided to uh, design my own. I decided that what I'd use would be a, a loose leaf design, and this would allow me to add different pages from different observing sessions, as well as detailed uh, drawings or photographs that I'd have done it from notes or sketches at a later time. And it would allow me to have a section for observing challenges that are either printed out from the monthly challenges here or from, I could include detailed charts that are printed out from software and whatnot. Sorry? Are we on the right slide? Uh, we should be on, that's, what number are we on, four? I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll let you know. I think we're okay for now. These are still Saguaro. Yeah, yeah, those are the Saguaro ones. Yeah. Okay, so now we're getting to my stuff. Okay. Okay, now the other advantage of having the, um, the loose leaf book is that it provides space for another page that I developed that's become almost as important as, as these pages. But I'll get, and that's my observing target list, and I'll get to that in a minute. This is the log page that I currently use most of the time. Okay, now the drawing area has increased uh, from the previous version. Next slide. Okay, and it's also, I've uh, in, uh, tightened up the, the note taking area, so it makes it a little better. It gets interspersed with sheets that are mostly for notes. Slide number seven. Okay, I use those a lot on the nights when I can't find what I'm looking for, or when the conditions are less than ideal, like last night. And occasionally, with one that has more sketching area, which is the next one, or less sketching area, which, yeah, there we go. I find it's, it's really convenient to have a variety of pages like this. I can choose the page that best suits my mood. Next slide. Okay, and the conditions of the observing session. The pages are easy to create using any uh, word processing software. 
just by laying out a series of lines and spaces and just leaving a space to one side for the for the drawing area or in the middle whatever it is you can format it with columns now the circles are simple to trace around an appropriate size glass or bowl or plastic tub but there are a lot of technically inclined people here and so if you're into high-tech stuff try tracing a CD or a DVD <laughs> you can either trace these onto a master page and photocopy it or just spend an evening tracing page uh, tracing CDs Okay, uh, next one. Okay, this is my original observing target list. It's very simple and basic, but after a while I found it was, it just wasn't quite right. And what I've switched to next one. is this one, which gives me a space to put in is that the chart thing. What are those? It's a, it's a button on oh no, use this. Ah. Use that button. Ah. Okay. So it gives me a place to put in little sketches of what it is I'm really looking for. And that's a lot easier to figure out in the dark with a really dim red light than a whole series of notes that say turn left at whatever. Okay, it just gives me a good idea of what I'm what I should be looking for at the eyepiece. One of the things I've learned is that if I pre-plan my observing sessions, they are much more productive and much more rewarding. Nights when I go out without a plan, I usually end up wandering the skies aimlessly and quite frustrated. Using the forms is pretty straightforward. The target list is, is compiled from readings from period <coughs> periodicals, studying the uh, star charts from the Rask challenges, internet magazines, whatever. I use them to record any object that I feel might be visible and interesting from my light polluted backyard. But I also keep a list of objects that will have to wait for the few times when I get out to dark sites. I have a section in my log binder for these pages and I review them regularly. I used to take my entire log book out, <coughs> uh, but several months ago I started using a folding clipboard. Okay, there uh, should be a next slide. Yeah. Uh, keep it closed when I'm observing and I and that keeps the pages dry and it takes up a lot less space on my work table. I keep a variety of uh, log pages. Okay, I keep extra log pages underneath here so whichever one I want I can just reach down and grab it and on the over here I have my observing target list. I use a little clip light I pick up at the dollar store, runs about a dollar every six weeks, you can't buy the batteries for that. Now I, <clears throat> what, I, what you have to do is you've got to paint the lens red, and I used acrylic paint, but for those of you who, don't, who only have wives instead of an art studio, fingernail polish works as well. Okay. Now I admit that sketching can be intimidating. I'm an artist and I found it intimidating the first few times I didn't do it, and the first few times I did. I still find that some of the open star clusters are a little more than I'm prepared to tackle. But the first thing to remember is that you're doing these sketches for yourself. You don't have to show them to anybody. The second thing is to keep it in perspective. All you're doing is making a series of dots inside a circle. I think most of us can draw dots. <laughs> Start with uh, double stars and then try maybe some small asterisms or an open cluster that's only got a few stars in it. From there you can move on to some of the really faint fuzzies because then you just have to make a faint smudge and blend it with your finger. Okay, you can start by make it marking the brightest stars that define the field. And when I'm doing this, I don't make corrections at the eyepiece. If I make a mistake, I just put an X through the star and then place it where it really should be and I can erase that later when I can really see what I'm doing. For nebulosity, I use the side of the, pen of the pencil lead and I smudge it or blend it with my finger. And then you go back and restate any brighter areas as required. Next slide. I think, think of the eyepiece as being a clock and note positions relative to the hours. Once you have the bright members drawn in, <coughs> the dimmer stars, fill in the dimmer stars in the galaxies or nebula. I think it was uh, Lucian Kemble of uh, Kemble's Cascade 
who used to throw the image out of focus so that only the bright stars were visible. Once he had those positioned, then he'd refocus the image and uh, locate the rest of the field. As you try to draw these fainter objects, you'll notice that you're looking very carefully for details to put down on paper, and you'll be studying the object more closely than when you were before you started sketching. After making a few drawings like this, you'll find that you feel confident enough to try more complex galaxy, or clusters and galaxies, planets, and maybe even some of those open clusters. Okay? It's really, really worth doing, and I, I, it's been a real bonus and a real boost to, to my observing, keeping these, these uh, logs and doing the sketches. I'm just thinking, well, that's good. Uh, go Thank you. Yeah, I'm, just, uh, I'm just thinking that maybe we could get some of the, uh, some of the forms uh, put up on our website if people want to have a look at them and try them out for themselves. And uh, uh, we could, what are they, Word links? Is that, are they Word docs? Or? They're PFL, PDFs. PDFs. Oh, PDFs. And I, right. have, I have a few of the pages here. If anybody wants, they're welcome to take them and photocopy them, whatever. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you, Gordon. Excellent. Okay. All right, Glenn. Yeah, back in 2001, I built a right angle binocular. In its original incarnation, it looked a little different uh, than this one. Instead of those bigger lenses, uh, the objectives at the front, these guys down here, I had originally made them with 35 millimeter objectives because they gave a bit of a sharper image and I wanted a, a more of a quality view. So I took the 35 millimeter objectives from another binocular. The eyepieces, they were taken from yet another binocular. <coughs> Uh, the Bushnell Extra Wide, and these eyepieces, I like them because they have uh, 85 degree apparent fields of view, which are even a bit wider than the famous Nagler eyepiece. And for me, one of the holy grails of an optical instrument is a large apparent field, because I want to feel like I've got my face up against the porthole looking up into the sky. So these little guys, they served me well for uh, several years, and then last summer, I got around to uh, changing them a little. Okay, here's just a look at the, uh, the guts or the innards uh, showing how the, uh, it's just a, an inexpensive Chinese uh, Amiki prism diagonal, you know, designed for uh, one and a quarter inch diameter focusers. And it's a prism that uh, bends a light 90 degrees but does not reverse it. So you have a correct, upright, and normal view. And all I did was mount the, uh, the prism minus the barrels and uh, on a piece of angle aluminum that carries it, I have three adjustment screws that are spring-loaded, and while I'm actually observing, if for some reason I need to tweak the collimation, I just need to adjust one of two little knobs so I can get a kind of XY adjustment to refine the collimation so that the view is nice and comfortable. And here it is further exploded. Uh, this was taken on the evening when I uh, began to uh, undertake my little project to further improve the view. Now, I told you that for years I was using it as a 35 millimeter aperture binocular. That gave nine power with a 10 degree true field of view. But what I wanted to do was use a larger diameter objective so I could get more light grasp, a little extra magnification, but mainly a brighter image. So I went back to these 50 millimeter objectives, which came from the Bushnell Extra Wide that these eyepieces came from. And I had some new adapters made up at the correct dimension and uh, attach the objectives. Now, I had known years ago when I was uh, investigating which ones to use that they were not as good. The objectives are very fast. They're f3.3 compared to most binoculars, which are typically f4. And even though it's not very much shorter, in that focal ratio, uh, every little bit of a shortening can really increase the amount of spherical aberration, which tends to soften the definition and you can't resolve things as clearly. Uh, the stars appear kind of like the, uh, the first round of Hubble telescope images where the primary was figured incorrectly uh, you know, due to an improper uh, null test configuration and the, it suffered from spherical aberration and it needed corrective optics. So what I decided to do uh, this past summer was to actually change the objective's uh, uh, surface shape because part of my day job is actually figuring 12 and a half inch diameter telescope mirrors into fairly high, uh, highly aspheric elliptical primaries for a uh, telescope that we make. And I thought, gee, if I can aspherize uh, an F2 
a fused silica primary, surely these little two-inch binocular objectives should be a dottle. So over a period of a couple evenings, I got around to uh, doing just that. The next one. So what I did uh, to find out uh, what I was starting with, I arranged to do a, a Ronke line test uh, via double pass autocollimation. Here I'm using a vastly oversized 14 inch diameter optical flat. It wasn't necessary to use one that big, but it was the one that was actually handy and mounted on a test stand. So I'm just using a, a very simple test here where I'm looking through a little piece of glass that has about 100 lines per inch uh, printed on it. So it's like a little screen with a dark line and a gap, line and a gap, and that's about four lines per millimeter. And then with a little light source mounted just below and then the red filter to increase the contrast because you know, even though the lens is achromatic, if you look at it with white light, you get the uh, chromatic aberration blending the pattern and it's a little harder to interpret. It's not as contrasty, so the red light helps there. And I got uh, certainly what I was expecting to see, more or less. And uh, I think the next slide will show, well, I, oh yeah, this here is it's a schematic of the test, first of all. So here's the observer's eye looking through the rocky grating. There's a red filter which will filter both the light coming out of a white LED and the light coming back into your eye. And here is the lens under test, and here's the optical flap mounted at some arbitrary distance behind the lens itself. To make the test more sensitive, you want to have the Ronke grating at or near the focus. Now, if the lens is very bad, you can start off with the test fairly far, either inside or outside of focus, to see the overall pattern. But as you're figuring and things improve, you necessarily have to get closer and closer to focus to make the test more and more sensitive so that you can figure out the errors that are there that are ideally continuing to be improved upon. And in the next slide, here's a simulated view, a bit exaggerated of what I was seeing when I looked at the lens the first time around before I began any figuring. And this here, it's a classic uh, spherical aberration, undercorrected it's called because uh, just uh, even the most perfect spherical surface of a lens will have undercorrected spherical aberration. And from looking a bit inside of focus, the little ronky <coughs> patterns that you see superimposed against the illuminated lens aperture tend to bow out in a pattern like this. But what I also saw, I wasn't too surprised, but it certainly explained why the view was so much worse in my rebuilt binocular with those lenses as opposed to the commercial binocular because it was effectively stopped down was now I was getting to be able to see a bit of a deflection, a sharp curving away which indicates that during manufacture the rough polishing in the factory in China where these things were cranked out tended to cause a turned down edge. So in addition to the usual spherical aberration you've got an extra defect where the lens is turned even more radically at the edge and that only worsens things. So our next slide is showing what I'm striving for is to make these Ronke lines as straight as possible because then you've got a correctly figured lens. Next. So the spherical aberration that I mentioned, here's a schematic representation showing what's going on. Now the three colors I've chosen for the rays here have nothing to do with the color of the light. I just chose the color to make the rays from the different zones of the lens easier to follow. And you can see with even the most perfect spherical lens, light coming from some distant object from the left through the middle parts of the lens will come to a focus here. Further away from the optical axis, light rays will come to a focus closer and rays from the edge will come to a focus even closer still. And a, uh, a kind of schematic representation of what you would see at different positions as you go through the focus would be when well inside the focus, if you've got your eyepiece field stop way in here, you'll see what looks like a kind of a bright outer ring and then a f uh, dimming fuzz in the middle. And then as you rack back closer to focus, you'll get what looks like a fairly uh, more or less evenly illuminated blob then back at about best focus, a tighter blob surrounded by a bit of a fuzzy halo. And then as you get into what would be about the focus for the center zone will be a very sharp little point, but a huge fuzzy halo. So as you're trying to get uh, focused on something, 
you know, you're presented with something like this and you're kind of hunting around trying to find the best, but it's never fully sharp. But when you've got a properly corrected lens, it then snaps into focus. It just, it's either sharp or it's blurry. And as you rack through focus, instead of these kind of mirrored or, or inverted patterns, you get what looks fairly similar. It's just like an expanding disc inside of focus, an expanding disc outside of focus. And if you have the same appearance, then you have a properly corrected lens. Next. Now to polish an existing spherical element, the most efficient way to do it is to make a pitch lap that has the, the laps that actually contact the, the lens, the facets, shaped kind of like these flower-like petals. The idea is to get the shape you want, you're removing minimal glass from the center, minimal from the outer edge, but you're taking off the most glass at what's called the 71% zone. And at that particular radius, well, it's 70.7%, that's actually the, uh, the radial position outside of which is half the lens area, and inside of that is the other half. It's the 50% dividing line of the area of the lens. So this way you can polish the aspheric figure you're going for with minimal glass removal. And indeed, when I did this, after even only about 10 to 15 minutes of polishing, when I did a quick test, I could see a, uh, a noticeable improvement. And then it just took longer and longer, continually refining, trying to make it as good as I could within limits, of course. I didn't want to push it to the nth degree because a binocular is being used in the low power regime. So it's not necessary to go for perfection by any means. Next. So here is the objective lens removed from its cell. It's just a kind of, a, I don't know, maybe some kind of polycarbonate molded plastic-like material. And the lens just drops in and is held in place with a simple retaining ring. No fancy collimation adjustments uh, or anything of that nature. It just drops in pretty simply. And here I've got it uh, placed so that the front surface is down. The rear surface, which I'm not working, I did all the work on the front surface, the crown element. So to protect the rear surface, all I did was cover it up with some blue uh, painter's masking tape so that during handling I wouldn't scratch or otherwise damage the coated surface. But of course, the front surface was not going to have a coating anymore after I'd done my work on it. Next. During polishing, I just set uh, my little pitch lap, which I had uh, made to the same diameter as the lens itself. And the spindle was running at maximum speed here. In this case, it was about one turn per second. Uh, I think about 50 to 60 RPM. And as it's turning, I'm just applying a bit of pressure and a little bit of randomizing wiggling motion, partial rotation, and just do all of that. And after about five to 10 minute spells, I would take it off, clean it, remove the tape, put it up on the test stand, have a look, see how things are progressing and back and forth and so on. Next. Now the pitch I used was relatively soft. I wanted a soft pitch that could conform to shape quickly as the glass changed shape because of its small size. But that meant that the pitch would squish out fairly quickly and I'd have to be refaceting it quite a lot. And I found that the fancy petal shape lap I showed you before just isn't practical. It's too much time to uh, carve that shape in, and especially in a, a two inch diameter tool. So all I did is I just kind of scored out roughly a square shape and just scalloped out some little parts in the middle. And that was a close enough approximation to uh, what I wanted to uh, get the shape uh, polished in. Next. So here is, this has been greatly brightened because I'm doing this testing in a darkened room in order to see the, you know, the relatively dim red, low contrast, red Ronchi pattern. And especially as it's getting improved, I'm having to test ever closer to focus where the Ronchi pattern is being magnified to the point where you're not seeing multiple uh, shadow bands. You're uh, examining just a part of a width of one just to see uh, what's happening very, very close to focus. And I don't know if I have another one after this. OK, so anyway, in the end, uh, it's been well worth it over two evenings to do two objectives. I managed to uh, end up with a binocular that is much better corrected. I figure that the resolution has improved by a factor of about two and a half times. So double stars before that I could not split are now very readily revealed. And star clusters, now they have myriads of little uh, pinpoint stars throughout them, whereas before they would be just little fuzzballs with the odd brighter star standing out as a little fuzzy blob. 
And uh, if anybody wants to talk to me about that a little bit more, if you're interested, I'll be available at the end of the meeting. <coughs> oh, I guess we have time for a question? Yep, go ahead. Yes. I have one question. Just, uh, you did two objectives. Did you, did you do separate ones per night? Yes. Oh yeah, it wasn't necessary because the, the degree of correction that's being put uh, into these things uh, has virtually zero effect on the focal length. It's not like they're going to change in any fashion and it only amounts to a matter of, uh, you know, something like um, several or maybe ten wavelengths of light, which is nothing. So the pitch lap, all it would take there is a few seconds of repressing with the second lens in and it's already conformed to shape and ready for polishing. Uh, did we have another question? Yes, Karen. What did you do with the Nothing. Uh, all you're doing is losing about 3% light, but I've more than made up for it because now uh, concentrating the light into a well-defined point allows me to see fainter. So I've lost 4% in transmission, but I've gained, uh, I'm not sure how much you could uh, define it as, but uh, very, very much more than that. Uh, by uh, the increased definition allowing me to see more detail and fainter stars. Yeah, I'd rather do without a coated, a coated surface if I can make the view sharper. Okay, I guess we'll hold there. If there are any other questions, you can talk to Glenn afterward. Thank you very much. It was very good. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, 3D presentation that Chris and I have put together. We just wanted something that was a bit fun. I ordered up these uh, 3D viewers from a place in California, Rainbow Symphony is a company. So you hold it with the, uh, with the white side toward your eyes. And uh, I'm going to ask Richard if he could take a picture of the audience. Can everybody hold up their glasses? You can come right up if you want to. All right. All the glasses up and looking at, uh, looking at Richard here. No, 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 looking at the screen. Oh, looking at the screen. Oh, yes. They look horrified or something. No, how, could they, how could they not? Yes. Thank you. And just for just for last, can you put them, turn them all around so you have the white side facing out? <laughs> so it's just yeah. This is gonna look more like the movies that we've that we've seen before. Everybody got their glasses up? All right. Thank you. That looks very strange. I'll, I'll show you. This is what it looks like. Okay. Yeah. So you have to hold them with the uh, with the white side. So the red is on your left. The blue is on your starboard side. Just like a, just like in a ship. Red to port. Green to starboard. And uh, how long is it on each? Okay, uh, how long are the slides on? So the slides are staying up there for about... The slides are staying up there for about 20 seconds. Tim, shut up and turn the lights off, would you mind? No. Okay. He's doing his pirate, his pirate act there. Okay. Now it's time, okay. <laughs> Can we put the lights right down? All right down? Yeah, please. Can you see that okay? Yeah. That's one of my relatives. <laughs> That's like my mother, actually. Oh. <laughs> All right, it's harsh on the saucer, man. But <laughs> All right. Is this on its automatic thing? Okay, here we go. This is the uh, ISS. And some of them, it takes a couple of seconds. Let your eyes just relax. And if you can't get them right away, take your glasses home. Look for these on the net later. You have all the time in the world then. And there's a really good effect. I know not everybody can do it, but if you're walking around, I've got this whole thing just following me right across. Very strange. I command thee to change. Is that 20 seconds? It's a little shot that I took when I was out and about. <laughs> I hope you're holding your breath. How many miles did I go yet? Yeah. <laughs> can you see the OC transport bus stalter? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now the, the on some of these here, the uh, the vertical component has been exaggerated. I don't, I didn't find out how many times. They call it the these are high rise images. They call them. Chasm looks like about 13 inches deep. <laughs> 13 inches deep. But you notice the text that was on there, the text was floating above all that. It's all Mars. But these are Mars, yeah. Now this one's a bit tough at first, but just this one, you really have to let your eyes relax. 
Well, you've got to go wall-eyed like Marty Feldman. <laughs> yeah. I can't do it. Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. I got it. I the foreground, the background is still tough. Pick, pick one Look down at the bottom. Turn off the edge. And sometimes it helps. Base jumping. Yeah, jump right off. Base jumping, yeah. Where's the diving board? <laughs> so this is from Mars. This is one of the uh, opportunity uh, uh, images. Yeah. Another Marty Feldman. Yeah, this, I don't know why this one should be more difficult, but once it pops in, it, it really pops in. You can start by looking at the bottom. That's easy yeah. to merge. Yeah. 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 I'm still not getting it. Anybody else not getting it? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, when you do that one at home, go and Google some of these images. You'll see all kinds of just Mars 3D, you're going to find this stuff. This is obviously not Mars. Mm -hmm. What was your first blue? <laughs> <laughs> it's the Mars Lunar Museum. Is <laughs> <laughs> a recent picture? Oh, this yeah. is the sound stage for the fake. Oh. Now this is the uh, this is the Apollo 17. Oh, I'm on the wrong side for me. Here comes Apollo Ooh. 17. This is the site where it's landed. It was right down in there, approximately. Wait for it. Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I mean. This is Chris playing, right? <laughs> This is what adds to the program. The lander was 3D if you could focus on it. <laughs> That's another Apollo 17. Okay, Chris, make a move. Give me the massif in the background there. Just wiggle the glasses side to side. So is this worthwhile to do? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Apollo 15 landing site, Hadley Rill, just up in the uh, the bay there. That's where Apollo 15 landed, right there. Next slide, Brian, oh yes. The next slide blows up just the landing area. That crater there is Hadley. There's Hadley C right there. Oh yes. Oh yes. How soon I forget, right? Unfortunately, I can't make it land. It seems to hover above the edge. <laughs> Well, that's why they don't have you doing the space program, man. If you can't land it. Follow the correct tra trajectory, though. Man, you must have one hell of a fuel budget. What do you mean to follow the correct trajectory? Of course. Remember who was putting this together, Glenn. There's your deep dish. With none of the toppings, apparently. <laughs> lots of cheese oozing out of that. Yeah, lots of cheese. Oh, it's one of the stuffed crust buns. Well, no more cheese than in this presentation, let me tell you. <laughs> but now, you know, I've noticed what I've, what I've seen when I look at this, when you look at it for a little bit longer, uh, you can start to see uh, different things. Like the zipper. Oh, there we go. Oh, my goodness. Oh! <laughs> Our new meeting chair, Attila Danko. Now, I have to tell you, when Attila was over at my house with Chris uh, on Wednesday evening, we were putting the program together. We had the slide, we had this Godzilla slide, uh, right, showing there, and uh, we had the Attila part hidden from him. And he was saying, oh, this will be a good surprise for people, this will be good, this, and, he, and we're thinking, yeah, you don't know the half of it, buddy, so. <laughs> All right, so that's it for, uh, that's it for uh, 3D Rask for, uh, for this month, okay? I hope you enjoyed. Okay, while we're doing the technical bit here, I'll just uh, introduce what I'm going to present to you today. Okay, uh, is the sound good? Okay, look, over the last few years, actually a number of years, <laughs> I dread to think of how many years now, I've talked to you about the geology of the rocky planets, I've talked to you about the geology of the moons of the outer planets, but I've always done it in two-dimensional PowerPoint. And I thought that it might be nice to do something different for Brian's last night. So how about actually visiting the planets and the moons as though you were really there? actually flying around in space from one to the other through the inner part of the solar system. The way that I've done this, I'm using a, a, a relatively new piece of software by Software Beast called Seeker. Now, first of all, 
no, I don't have stocks and shares in the company, nor do I get a commission. It just happened to be a piece of software that came out. I was interested in what it might do, so I decided to give it a try. Now, what it is, it's, it's a program that does 3D animation of already pre-rendered 3D objects. It can do planets, it can do asteroids, it can do star patterns. All of these are faithfully rendered, um, not only in their right place, but also in their right time. And this is the key thing. Now, you can run this program manually. You can sit at the keyboard, you can drive it like you drive a car, or you can imagine you're driving a spaceship. Or, as I've done this time around, you can actually put together a standalone animation. And the way you do it, luckily, because I don't, I'm not a programmer, Luckily, what you do is you use a set of pre-prepared pre macros. You simply call these macros and then you put in some variables which tells the macro whether you want to go left or right, forward or backward, how fast you want to go and what have you. Now the principle of the program is that you're in a spaceship. And, but the spaceship, of course, is in space and space is big and things tend to happen slowly in space. So in order to, uh, to actually make motions apparent and cut down on wait time, you can actually speed up time. Now this gets a little tricky because when you're putting an animation together, you've got to keep track of not only the rate at which time is passing, but also the speed you assume you're traveling at. So when I first started doing this, I think I was just moving forward a little way and suddenly find I shot right out of the solar system because I'd forgotten that I'd already sped up time by several thousand times. Now, as you're moving around in space, there's no such thing as up. But we Earthlings like to see things in certain orientations, otherwise we get uncomfortable and sometimes we get lost, especially with things like planets and star patterns. Now, when you're navigating around in 3D space, that can actually rotate your spacecraft's uh, horizontal, as far, as far as you're concerned, in rather unexpected ways. So sometimes it's necessary to correct the ship's attitude to make things look the way that we expect to see them. So I've made actually three animations. I'm only going to show you one tonight. I've made one of the, the inner solar system, which is really focusing on the rocky planets. I made another one on the outer solar system, focusing on the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, and their associated moons. And I made a third one, which is also in the outer solar system, fo focusing on the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune and their moons. So tonight I'll show you just the one. It's about 15 minutes long. And we can look at others if Attila decides that he likes what he sees here tonight and decides he's going to ask me back. Um, I'm going to improvise with a running commentary, a little bit like a sports commentator, because this is like watching a game. I can't stop it. Seeker does have this, this one drawback. I can't stop and start. Once I start, once we launch the thing, it's going right through to the end. Now, this is the first time I've tried doing this through a projection, so we'll see exactly how we, how we make out. Chris, I'm just a little bothered that I can't actually see my screen on, the, on that screen there. Any thoughts? Now, what I'd like us to do is to make sure that this is actually, I'm actually in the program. Do you think I ought to back out of the program there? The oh, oh, okay. There we go. Okie dokie, looking good. So I want this to be a collective uh, presentation. I'm going to focus on the actual planets that we'll actually look at. But in the background, you're going to see all kinds of star patterns that you'll recognize. Sometimes you'll recognize it the right way up, and sometimes they won't be. So if I forget or miss pointing out that we've actually got a star pattern there that somebody might recognize, shout out so that others can actually see it. Oh, and to make this look like, it's, uh, like, like, like it really is as us actually uh, uh, looking as astronomers, I brought my green astronomy laser with me. <laughs> so I'm going to start this thing up, and we'll see how we do. Now, we've got sound as well. We've got sound as well because you'll hear the, the gentle throbbing of the spacecraft's engines. Because, of course, there's no real sound in space. All right, let's get the right one here. And we can turn that down a little bit. But uh, here we go. This is, like I say, a software beast, and this actually tells you the object information. Here we are. We're actually starting out in the outer part of the solar system, looking up. Now, there we are. Here's, the, here's our solar system with the inner solar system blown up. That's where we're going. And here's Pluto. This is where we're starting from. And obviously, apart from Pluto, all of their planets are actually sitting in the ecliptic plane and we'll be seeing this a number of times during the simulation, the animation, in the inner part of the solar system. So we're starting out here at Pluto. I just want you to realize that when we jump back to Pluto in a moment, it's a bit of a cheat. This is the one object that Software Beast had to invent because, of course, no one's actually been to Pluto and actually photographed this yet. So this is what we think it would look like. It's, a, it's an icy body. It undoubtedly does have some blotches on it. I have no idea how fast it actually rotates, but I had to speed time up by about a thousand times just to get it to do this, to do this at all. 
And if I remember rightly, I think that over there, we're looking, there we go, there is the constellation Corvus. And Corvus, as you can see here, is the right way up. Now we're pulling back away from, from, from Pluto so that we can actually see the pluto sharon system. And we're, we're, we're going to pull back here so that uh, we get a fair bit of distance. And then we're going to swing things around. You can see that we're looking at, uh, um, obviously the sun is on this side. This is the dark side over here. So we're going to swing around, we're going to move around the spacecraft, so we actually put both uh, P uh, Pluto and Sharon, thank you, uh, Pluto and Sharon, and here's, uh, here's uh, um, uh, Sagittarius. Uh, we put them both on the sun side, and here time is now being accelerated, and we'll see what actually happens here. I hope I give the game away here. Pluto, in fact, is going to eclipse Sharon. Passes right behind, and on we go. So we're going to set, sight, uh, set, set, set the, the course now for the inner part of the solar system. And you'll be, uh, perhaps be somewhat surprised. You'll, please, please just keep holding them up. Uh, you'll perhaps be somewhat surprised at, at just how far away uh, Pluto is from our sun. Here's, here's Saturn. There's Jupiter. And the sun is there. That is what illuminates what you look through your telescopes at when you do get to see Pluto. Notice how Saturn actually was, was uh, I've lost it already. Saturn was illuminated, Jupiter is not. So Jupiter is on this side of the sun, whereas Saturn was on the other side. Hence we could see Jupiter's dark side and we could see Saturn's uh, uh, daylight side. Here's the Earth, here's Venus. Venus must of course be on the other side of the sun. Earth is off to one side, Venus is nicely illuminated, there's Mercury illuminated yet again. So it must be on the far side of the sun. As we come in, the sun is going to blind us, and so we'll throw in a solar filter immediately, so that we can at least see what the hell's going on here. But of course, it turns out that everything's the wrong way around. If you watch, uh, you'll see, I think you'll see the Pleiades there, and there is the Hyades of Taurus, and you'll probably see just the top end of, 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 um, of Orion. The ship was not actually oriented within the ecliptic plane. So we're just adjusting the orientation of the ship here. But we just paused here over the sun. And here you can see the sun itself is rotating beneath us. Again, we've had to speed uh, time up so that we could actually see this rotation. Here's a sunspot cluster. Rather nice thing here is you notice the limb darkening here, which is a classic feature of the sun. And so it's, I think the, 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 uh, the presentation is quite realistic. And we'll see another uh, 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 very, very nice um, uh, s a, a sunspot cluster coming around in just a moment. This one's a little difficult to see any detail, but this one coming around here, you can see quite nicely the, 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 the dark umbra in the, in the core surrounded by the gray penumbra. And of course, these things here are related to the complex magnetic field of the sun. These are patches of the sun's surface, which are a few thousand degrees uh, cooler than the rest of the sun. Now, we're now moving into orbit around the sun, and so the background will begin to move. And you can see Saturn and Mars over there. Here comes Mercury. You notice how these planets are lying in the ecliptic plane. There's Earth. Just The ecliptic plane isn't actually perfect. It is an approximation. There's Jupiter. And so we're, rota we're actually orbiting Neptune. We're orbiting faster than the sun itself is rotating. There's Uranus. And now what we're doing, we're pulling out and we're heading for, for Mercury. Well, we just turned the solar filter off and got blinded again. But we're using our rear viewer. So we're actually watching the sun recede as we move away from it in our spacecraft. Venus, obviously, is on the far side of the sun. Here's the Pleiades. Here's the Hyades. So we now know that the ship is actually oriented, for us Earthlings, the right way up. So we're pulling back and heading towards Mercury. This is actually counting down the distance that we have to go to get to Mercury. It's going so fast I can't read it from here, and I'm sure you can't read it from there. Here's Mercury. Mercury, of course, is not quite locked in tidally to the sun, but it does rotate very, very slowly. So I didn't speed up time too much. You can just see it beginning to creep around, and there, of course, is Scorpio, and here is Sagittarius. So we're still the right way up. Mercury rotating very slowly. It's got a, a, a face that looks very much like the moon. And of course, as we know, Messenger has recently taken new photographs of it. So we're now swinging into a polar orbit. This way we can actually then see the daylight side and just coming up on the horizon there, the night side at the same time. And this you'll see, is, oh, that by the way is the Milky Way with its various textures in it. But it's mirror reversed actually. The Milky Way is mirror reversed there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. North is for south in it. So we're pulling away from, from Mercury, and we're going to head off towards Venus. 
And you'll see something rather interesting as we actually uh, arrive at Venus. We'll actually see it before we get there. Keep your eyes on the, on, on, on the constellations. There's Orion upside down. Here's the Hyades of Taurus upside down. There's the Sun, there's the Pleiades. So our ship, in moving around in 3D space, has actually managed to turn itself upside down. We're heading past the Sun because we're heading for Venus, which is there. We're not going to hit the Sun, by the way. It's just that the, the glow is, here, is blinding us. We cut in the solar filter. There's the Sun with its sunspot. There's, again, Orion, Hyades, Pleiades, upside down, and there's Venus. And we'll see an interesting phenomenon as we actually approach Venus, right? well, actually, once we get there. There again, Milky Way. Space is very big. We're traveling relatively slowly. But, but mind you, uh, we're actually traveling uh, much faster than any uh, 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 spacecraft we've actually ever created to, to date. But I wanted to give, nevertheless, this impression that, yes, it's still going to take us a while to actually get from A to B. But I didn't want there to be too much wait time. So, OK, we've now locked in on Venus, and we're going to head in re relatively quickly. You see the countdown up here. There we go. Now, notice this. Venus is rotating, except that it's rotating as Earth rotates. It's rotating towards the east. Well, that's wrong, because Venus actually rotates, quote unquote, backwards. It has retrograde motion. So clearly, our ship was upside down. We knew that from the star patterns. So we're going to go into polar orbit here around Venus, over the pole. Again, we see the day side and the night side. We'll bring, bring it right around. And you may start to see some constellations the right way up. Venus is now rotating the correct way. And we're going to keep, there's Jupiter, by the way. We're going to keep on going right over onto the, onto, onto the, north, po onto the north pole of Venus. And then we're going to head for Earth, homeworld. This one's actually, I think, quite spectacular. Not only because uh, it's, a, it's, it's a set of images which we relative, read, readily understand, but the Earth really is very, very spectacular as seen from space. And the rendition here within the, the program is good. There's Mercury looking at, it, we're looking at its daylight side. And you can see that the name of the Earth here is looking kind of fuzzy. Well, there's an obvious reason for that. There are actually two names superimposed there, as you'll see as soon as we get in there. You can see the names just beginning to separate. And obviously, that's the Earth and the Moon. I think that's Procyon there, but I'm not entirely sure. That's why I was hoping you folks would actually help me out with the star patterns. OK, so here we come on the Earth. And we, thank you. And we've, we, we're going to correct our equatorial attitude. Do you notice the reflection of the sun on the Earth? I think this is beautifully done. And frankly, this, this is actually breathtaking, even though we're sitting in an auditorium and, and, and looking at a stimulation. You don't need to look at the star patterns to know that we're actually the right way up this time around. So we're, we're going, going into polar orbit here, and you'll see why in just a moment. So we'll obviously be able to see the day side, daylight side, and the night side. It's cloudy, not all. It's cloudy. It, well, isn't that, uh, isn't, isn't that par for the course? That's Tim's fault. <laughs> OK. So here's the northern polar cap. And we're going to pull out. We're pulling back very quickly, because I want you to be able to see, as we did with, uh, uh, with uh, um, Pluto, I want you to be able to see the Earth-Moon system. Now, you won't recognize any of the constellations here because we're looking south, so we're looking at stars that you and I don't see from here. Any of you that have been to Australia will have an advantage over the rest of us. So here's the Moon in relatively circular orbit uh, about the Earth. And what we're going to do, we're actually going to drop from this polar position. We're going to send the ship down back towards an equatorial view of the Earth. And so you'll see that the, the orbit of the moon, which is circular here, here we go, we're now dropping the ship back into the equatorial plane. And so while we're watching the moon still in orbit, the apparent uh, uh, shape described by the orbiting moon will go from circular to highly elliptical. And eventually that ellipse will become so tight that it becomes a back and forth movement here. You can see it just beginning to come back now. Well, we're now actually going to be setting course for the moon. So we're pulling away from the Earth. Please do, do keep calling out those constellations. And here, of course, we're looking at the far side of, of, of the moon. You notice how few dark mare it has. Here we see the familiar uh, 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 near side of the moon coming around. Obviously, the moon doesn't rotate at this rate. I've had to really speed this up to do this. 
Here you can see the, the Orientale Basin, which we can just about see at times a good, a good libration. There goes the, the Earth, like a blue marble going behind. And we're going to set course for Mars. So here are the planets lined up more or less in the ecliptic. There's the Sun, pretty well familiar to us. And there's Mars. Mars must actually again be on the far side. Oh, there goes the Earth. Notice how we see the night side, because the Earth is to our side of the Sun. Mars is well illuminated, so obviously Mars is on the far side, as is Jupiter on the far side of the Sun. Mars is a fair ways away. Uh, there's Sagittarius. And Sagittarius is sort of on end here, so normally it would be, its long axis would be like this, so we're clearly not right way up. That, of course, is the Milky Way. We'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll have to send a, a, an email to the, the folks at Seeker. So anyway, you can see a lot of the detail here. Here's the, 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 the Martian Valley. There's uh, 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 Olympus, the three volcanoes on Tharsis. Uh, that is the Elysium. Oh, and these, of course, are Phobos and Deimos sort of whizzing around like gnats around, around Mars. Whoop, that's, that's not an error. That, that indeed is the, is, is the closer moon. There's Phobos, the further moon, so Deimos is, uh, is uh, no, sorry, Deimos is the further moon and, uh, and uh, Phobos is the closer one. Just want to sort of move over so we can actually see what the sun looks like from Mars. We've already seen it from Pluto. There's the Pleiades, there's the Hyades, so we know that we're the right way up. There's the sun as seen from, uh, from, from, from Mars. Significantly smaller than as seen from Earth. But clearly, there's no, po there's no problem in identifying it. We'll go back to Mars again. I'm certainly glad the engines are continuing to rumble because I wouldn't want to get lost out here. We sort of ran out of fuel or something. So here we are. With, we're going into polar orbit around, around, around Mars. This time it's going to roll right the way through from the daylight side. There's the polar cap over to the, the nighttime side. And obviously, if we're looking at the nighttime side, we're going to expect that there's the sun on the far side there. Don't try and identify the, the, the star patterns. It's going way too fast for me as well. There's the Milky Way for what, whichever way around it is. And we'll come, we'll, we'll, we'll come around into polar position above the, the ice cap here, and then we'll pull back once more. Pulling back once more now, again, to be able to see the, the Martian moons uh, around Mars itself. There goes Phobos, whizzing around like a, like a mosquito. There comes Deimos. You now very clearly see how the, 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 the moon system is, uh, is structured and, and, and paced. They actually go into eclipse. And there you go. It's a lot of fun, but be careful. If ever you decide to actually try and get a hold of this program and play around with it, it can be a little bit like a drug. You really have to sort of pull away from this thing every now and again because there's it's a lot of trial and error involved. It really is at a beta level, I would suggest, but it's actually a lot of fun. Is the sound down? Would the sun be that dim if you're looking from, from where we were looking back at Mars and you could see the sun behind and you could see the stars around the sun? Uh, is the sun really that dim that we could see the stars around it like that? Okay. But since I didn't recognize that uh, the Milky Way was actually a mirror image, maybe you should take that as a piece of salt. But we had nodding heads here, so I think your explanation was, uh, was correct. All right. So, uh, all right. So off we go with the observations. And I'll just ask the people who, uh, who know they are presenting observations tonight if you want to make your way around here so we can move through them a step at a time. All right. Off we go. Here is that conjunction I was telling you about. It's a Santa Moon conjunction from Victoria, B.C. <laughs> They have this Christmas village shop there that's uh, open all year round. So anyway, all right. Uh, Paul, did you want to talk about that from uh, there or what do you want to do? No, so I'll talk from here. Uh, this is NGC 136. It's a very small open cluster in Cassiopeia. 
Uh, I used to swear at this thing when I did visual observing because it's only a, a minute and a half, a minute and a half, an arc minute and a half uh, in uh, diameter, and you, it's very hard to get it to, uh, to resolve it. But uh, w as you can see, this is uh, only a 20-second uh, uh, exposure with a 2x2 two two bin, and uh, you can see that you can see it very well. And uh, so uh, sometimes these things you, you can't just see with the, you, you probably would have to have a, a 30 inch telescope. Okay, or something like that. all right, we'll go to the next one there. This is NGC uh, 628, uh, otherwise known as M74. It's in Pisces, a face on galaxy. Uh, it's a spiral, you can see that. Uh, this is stacked, this is a five minute uh, shot consisting of uh, 15, 20 seconds. Stacked uh, with the uh, SD10 uh, uh, Santa Barbara uh, camera and a 14 inch telescope. Already? And this is uh, NGC 772. This is uh, in uh, Aries. It's uh, also a stacked photograph, a five minute exposure consisting of uh, 15, 20 second uh, uh, shots. And it, it, this is uh, uh, a beautiful, yeah, it recently had a, a lot of, uh, I think my girls showed them last year, so it had a lot of novas in it, supernovas in it. Yeah, it looks like a lot of other galaxies maybe in the background area. Oh, yes, there are, yes, yeah. Okay. All right. So, Mike, girl, uh, if you want to come up, I'll go give uh, Paul your observing token. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I haven't been here for several months, but uh, Brian and Chris were uh, really good to keep uh, some of my images uh, in the background uh, in case I did show up again sometime. So thank you very much, guys, for keeping okay. those for me. Uh, as we know, we really can't see this object anymore, uh, this, this season anyway, uh, M16, the Eagle Nebula. Uh, I took this uh, back in uh, August when it was uh, quite good. It was a very, very good night. I think it was August 19th of uh, this year. Uh, very lovely transparency for an object that low. Uh, and uh, next one, Chris. Uh, and I also got the Trifid as well and uh, Sagittarius. And that was, uh, you know, as, as, as may, uh, seasoned observers know, that uh, that object is not particularly easy to get really good sharp uh, images of because you're only talking about 25 degrees above the horizon at best. So next one, Chris. Okay, remember this guy? Uh, I talked about it, I think, actually I talked about it uh, last time I was here in August. Uh, this is a uh, Nova in o an Ophiuchus that was discovered on May 25th of this year. Uh, and I had presented that uh, a second nova was found uh, only about three degrees away from this object and the two are literally almost mirror image, uh, images of each other when it comes to how fast they, uh, the light decayed in each one of these. This is uh, what's called a, a slow nova and this one here is still detectable. Uh, and I've, I have predicted that it will be protect, detectable all the way until middle of next year, at least. It may be even longer than that. The first one decayed within 60 days. Or sorry, the second one. The second nova had decayed in 60 days. It's gone. You can't even see it. And there is a correlation. Uh, I found out over on the web, uh, uh, basically from the uh, AAVSO, the uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers, that there is an equation that you can actually plug in in which... Uh, you can find out how far away a nova is in the Milky Way by how fast it's uh, from maximum to two magnitudes below that. And I found a paper on that, and I found that, uh, that the equations have been totally mangled, and I had to reverse engineer everything. But I actually, do we have time for that, uh, Brian? To, to well, present? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. Yeah. yeah. No, no one wants I to see equations. I yeah, no, no one wants to see <laughs> equations. No, I know, I understand. <laughs> no, but uh, it's now been corrected and now in the, in, in, on their website. And so uh, people can actually use them now. Uh, they've been, they were, they were, they were, I, I found they were horrible. So, yeah. yeah. And so I calculated that uh, both novae were approximately 6,000 light years away. Uh, and so uh, now there's a lot of grain of salt to be taken with that because that equation itself is under debate. It's under fierce debate. Actually, there's several equations that are all uh, c competing for dominance. And so, as normal in science, there's going to be eventually a theory that fits everything. Uh, interstellar extinction is taken into account? Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Jeez. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and that's what's, what's really taken with the grain of salt. 
because if it wasn't for interstellar extinction, the Milky Way, he's talking about the Milky Way actually, the Milky Way does have a density and it gets in the way of the light. If it weren't for that, these stars would be naked eye at NOVA. These guys were about uh, magnitude 10 to 12 at maximum. So we'd see the NOVA pop up at naked eye uh, if it weren't for that. But the extinction factor is the real question mark. Uh, the closer you get to the center of the Milky Way, the more question marks arise because we know less, less and less about the true density of that area. How can you? We can only see in an immediate neighborhood, right? So uh, next, Chris. Uh, this is a graph that I made uh, of the uh, brightness. You can see the second nova here is, uh, has decayed in 60 days. It's basically below my, my detection. But the first one just keeps going and going and going and going. In fact, both novae are almost the same distance as that I used in the, uh, uh, if I plug them both in the same equation, uh, both of them are almost the same distance, but because of the interstellar extinction, this one appeared two magnitudes dimmer than that one, even though it was only three degrees away. Because you're getting that much closer to the Milky Way uh, center axis of the Milky Way. So this is the last one here. This was measured on October 19th, and then, of course, as normally what happens, it goes behind the sun or gets lost in twilight. I couldn't detect it anymore. I barely got this one uh, just after twilight uh, ended. Uh, actual, actu actually, just after nautical twilight ended, I got this one. So I'm going to pick, pick it up back up again, uh, end of February or March, keep going. And I have been talking to some of the representatives of the AAVSO, and they let me write a paper for them uh, down there. So uh, uh, hopefully it'll be, uh, it'll be quite good. And also the, uh, the journal here, uh, RSC Journal, let me write another article for uh, mid the middle of next year. So they're going to be similar, but, but, dim but, but, di but different in significant ways. Thanks, Chris. Uh, last month when Comet Cardinal was discovered, I decided, well, I wonder if I can see it. I always do that whenever someone says, uh, discover something interesting. So I thought 14th magnitude comet shouldn't be too tough. So turn my stuff, uh, turn my uh, equipment to it, and I just got it right there. And you can just see a little tail coming out of this baby there. So, uh, yeah, this, this object is really close to the pole right now. It's about maybe several, a couple degrees away from the pole, which is amazing. This was about maybe when it was about seven degrees away from the pole, so it was easier to find. Next please, Chris. I did get it. <laughs> Barely. This was, I only got 30 minute window and that was it. I call it the miracle shot because I tell you, I was out there and I managed to get the three and it was a beautiful sight. Can you just imagine three objects, the brightest three objects in the night sky other than iridium flares and uh, there they were, all three together in a little, tight little triangle in the sky. Absolutely fa phenomenal. So next Chris, is there anything else? Oh yes, I'd like to introduce to you a uh, new uh, program that I've, uh, between myself and the Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority ha have created. This is called the Mississippi Mills Night Sky Conservation Program. This is actually for the International Year of Astronomy. I've been running several courses and several uh, uh, sky tours and star parties uh, for the Milk and Tail, as some of you know. And I decided to uh, put them all under a program, an umbrella, basically, to get more publicity. IYA is for publicity, isn't it? That's what it is. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and it gives publicity for myself, and it gives publicity for the uh, light pollution abatement program over at the Mississippi Valley Conservation. So uh, mo everything's on the website. A website's already made, already works. Everything's there. Uh, the critical information like location, times, courses, payment, enrollment options, it's all there. All you got to do is go to this address right there and it's all yours. You can take a look and go around. Even objects for the first class in the springtime and the first uh, star party in August, you can see inter uh, uh, in in get introduced to interesting objects you can see at each one. So, and you can see uh, curriculum, everything for both uh, courses. Uh, the courses are $75 each, by the way. Excellent. Anything else, Chris? No? Okay, that's it. excellent. Okay, here's your observing token. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, thank you very much, All right. Brian. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Excellent. Bob. You're chuckling. Why are you chuckling? I just need to start with. Well, when uh, Rolf last week said that uh, nobody had ever taken a picture of the South Galactic Pole, I decided to do that. And uh, 
uh, in that month, I had uh, just on, um, let's see here, November 29th was the only day I could take pictures. They had an hour. So this is about, uh, about a 40 minute exposure and it's in the middle of that frame. Very exciting shot. <laughs> Actually, there are some galaxies in there. If I had more time, you'd see some galaxies. But other than that, it's pretty boring. OK, Chris. Uh, this is one of the challenge objects. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this uh, was actually taken before the, uh, it was announced as a challenge object. I just happened to have taken an image of it. And I got this on October uh, 25th and November the 1st. And there's about three hours of exposure there. Uh, but it's really low in the sky. so it's. It, my, the resolution of the picture is pretty bad because of the low altitude it was. I think maybe when I go south sometime, I'll try it again. It's a fabulous object. It uh, fills up a giant chunk of the frame of my camera. Okay, next one. And this is the other challenge object. This is uh, 288. It's a really neat little, a little uh, cluster underneath uh, NGC uh, 253. And uh, I got about half an hour on this, and it's so low in the sky, and I did this on November 29th. And it's, uh, I, I got half an hour, and then it just vanished into the murk uh, of the low altitude. Uh, but still, it looks, again, it's a very interesting cluster. This is strictly grayscale, by the way, no color in this one. And last one. And this is how they relate to each other uh, in the sky. And those are, those are placed according to the... The, the scale that you see there. Do I have any labels on those? Yeah, and there's how you can see them. And that's how they appeared in the sky also, just like that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mike Wolfson and I saw both challenge objects from last month, uh, the uh, Southern Pinwheel Galaxy 253 and the Globular Cluster from my observatory in Perth. And uh, this is approximately what it looked like. We managed to get it into a single eyepiece field of view. But just so that you don't think we did this with my 25-inch telescope, we use this rather modest <laughs> instrument. Um, this is just an Ackermann. It's quite an economical instrument, too. We use relatively low power. The only trick was making sure we positioned ourselves so that we could see down to 20 degrees. In other words, you don't need a 20. F5 or F8? F5. That's an F6. Nobody would say that we're anal retentive in this club. <laughs> but, you know, if, you can, if, if, if we can recognize the Milky Way isophotes are backwards on a map, then, okay, we can find bugs like this, too. Anyway, the point being is you don't need a large telescope to do some of these um, challenges. Uh, but from my point of view, this one's a little too easy, so I'm about to fix that. Okay, next deep sky challenge. I thought it would be really fun to pick a large globular cluster. But not M13, it's only 150 light years across, or 165 light years across. I figured something bigger. How about the globular cluster G1, also called Mayall 2, which is 650 light years across? M31, right? Yes. I'll shoot you later for giving away the story. <laughs> However, the trick is that it's only 10 arc seconds across. And the reason why is because it isn't part of uh, M31. Actually, it looks like it's very far away from M31. This is gives you clues how large the M31 galaxy really is. It's in the halo of M31. It's about 100, 170,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. The tricky part is finding it in a telescope. So the trick is to um, locate the star 32 Andromeda and then star hop from there. Piece of cake. Actually, it was a piece of cake. I saw Hildrick Brown do this with a star chart at his eyepiece with his 15-inch telescope. He went back and forth from the star chart to the eyepiece with a flashlight, and he star hopped at least 15 to 20 star fields. Maybe it felt like more. And I was amazed because I cannot do that. I find that I need so much light to be able to see star chart at the eyepiece that it ruins my night vision. So the only way I can do this is to draw my own constellations and memorize them in advance. Now, the only way I can remember them is to come up with a completely ridiculous story that explains the constellations. <laughs> so I figure you guys can do this too. And you know, it, could, it could happen like this. Here, this is the geometry proof that you hated in high school. This is the uncomfortable chair you wrote the exam on. <laughs> and of course, that was the last exam of the year. And at, at the end, you rushed out and you took a, a jump off the diving board for joy, making a beautiful swan dive. But your Mickey Mouse watch, which was on your right hand, 
fell off in two pieces. There's the watch face and the wristband, and it was the Mickey Mouse watch face that is Globular Cluster G1. How do I know that? Because that's what it looks like in the eyepiece. See the ears? <laughs> I kid you not, this actually works. I came up with this ridiculous story several days before I went up to my observatory with no chart at all. I was able to find G1 with a relatively high power eyepiece because I recognized the Mickey Mouse appearance after having found the geometry proof and the uncomfortable chair and the springboard and the swan dive and there was the wristband and the Mickey Mouse watch style. So you could do it too. So here's the summary. So the challenge is extragalactic globular cluster G1 or may all 2. It's 10 arc seconds across. It's magnitude 13.7. I suggest using about 200 power so you can see the shape. I checked some observing ports. People have detected this with a 10 inch uh, telescope. To see it as a cluster, I'd, I'd recommend 15. That's the, the aperture that Hildrick Brown was using. However, with the 16 inch, like our club's telescope, you can see a total of 15 globular clusters in M31. That's what um, uh, Doug Welch did in uh, 1979 with our telescope. However, to see it as a picture, you'd need a slightly larger aperture and a place where you'd have really good seeing, because that's a Hubble photograph. Okay, beautiful shot from Rolf Meyer. It's unfortunate Rolf's not here tonight, but uh, he'll be able to see this on the website later. All right. So we had a nice, uh, nice image of the moon, and what I wanted to do was concentrate on a couple of areas. Uh, and it's a lunar challenge, but it's a, it's not, not so much a challenge as a, as a maybe a different way of looking at the, the moon. If we can go ahead. To so a couple of areas I call the Northern Gateway, going from Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity, into the Sea of Rains, Mare Imbrium. And also uh, what I call the Southern Line, it's like a tram line with all the stops along the way. All right, let's go to the Northern Gateway. All right, there's the Sea of Serenity, Mare Serenitatis, and going through, this is Mare Imbrium, of course all in darkness right now. And if you look through, you can take things a step at a time. Uh, I've put all in green, all the mountains, right? So you can look at the various mountain ranges and use those as, a, as identifiers, places to become familiar with. And uh, it's, uh, you'll see when we go on the, uh, the southern tram line as well, uh, getting all these little local addresses. So in other words, what you're doing is you're turning the, the moon from a, a foreign object into uh, your neighborhood. You, you create your own little neighborhoods on the, uh, on the moon. So right here is where we saw uh, one of those 3D images of. Uh, of the Apollo 15 landing site at Hadley Rill, okay, with the crater Conan, and uh, just up in here was Hadley C, that uh, small crater in the rill. All right, the, the uh, Alpine Valley going across here. And this is a beautiful area to, to look at, and uh, he's got a nice image here of, uh, of the crater Cassini with uh, the craters A and B uh, inside it. All right, and a nice uh, promontorium here, promontory coming out this way, and lovely places to sketch as well, okay, I know we've got a sketcher right, in the, well, two sketchers right in the back, that part of the, uh, the audience tonight, all right, okay, let's go to the next one, all right, sinus medii, okay, so now we're coming down the tram line, so it's a matter of, well, what do you do when you've got something like this, and you're looking with your star chart, and it's just like uh, Attila was saying about Hildred going back and forth from his chart, that's what I do, until you learn the neighborhood so that we know that, yeah, you know, Herschel and uh, Herschel lives just uh, right next door to Ptolemaeus, Alphonsus, and Arzakel. It's, uh, it's, it's three in a row, one, ten, five, oh. And they become, they become friendly neighbors. So as you're going along uh, and you're getting farther along, you're saying, oh, what usually what happens is you start to get, uh, the situation becomes more and more confusing. But if you turn it into local neighborhoods, then it's less confusing. All right, so we'll put those up on the website. I don't uh, need to go digging into uh, any more of that right now. And uh, you, I think you get the idea of what's going on and see what you can come up with with your own observing of the, of the moon. All right? Aha, uh -huh. here we are. All right. Uh, so this is Tim's coming. Tim's moment. What's that? A Tim's moment. A Tim's moment, yeah. I just tossed my other Tim's mug there. and Yeah, that was from our rocket launch, eh, Bill? Remember, eh? When we did the rocket launch there uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago? Um, what Chris and I have done is uh, wanted to put a retrospective together of the past, uh, the past two years, and this is how we'll end my, uh, my portion of the, of the meeting. So we'll just hang on a second for that. Uh, okay, that's, that's okay, that's okay. You can just stay where you are there. But the first thing I want to do is uh, uh, say thank you to, uh, to Chris Teron, all right? Because uh, Chris, you're the guy that, uh, that made it work for me, and if you wouldn't mind coming up here, if you're not in a second. too busy fussing <laughs> stuff there, right? 
I didn't have this next one just quite ready. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, I've got a little, it's taking me a second to open this tiny little bag here. I have an observing token for you. How about if I do it right at your computer? I have a nice little uh, special observing token that I got for Chris. It's my way of saying thank you for, uh, for all the good work that you've done to, to help make it uh, work for us. Right? Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And uh, the other person uh, who's helped me make it work uh, just on the technical side here is, uh, has been Tim Cole. And uh, Tim, you're at the back there. I've got a, uh, I think the world of what you've done, I've got a nice little spinning globe here for you. I just want to say thank you for the work that you've done uh, behind the scenes to help uh, make sure that we've got all of the uh, technical side that's running as smoothly as possible. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you there. All right. Uh, just before I get going with the retrospective, it just runs for about five minutes. It's set to a little bit of music if we got everything <laughs> running properly. Uh, and uh, so, but before I do that, uh, Attila, are you around? It's time to turn over the keys of office to you. And of course, the keys of office, uh, maybe we could put the lights up, Tim, just for a minute, please. All right, of course, the keys of office is the famous box for the, uh, for the door prize tickets, all right? And also, uh, it says Attila Danko, RASC Ottawa meeting chair, November 2008, 2009. So we had council sign uh, with best wishes. So put your name tag on, Attila. If I last that long. If you last that long, we'll see. All right? All righty then. Okay, so we'll be ready to go. Tim, we've got sound? So watch our sound there. Just give me a second before. Uh oh. I lost my star. And uh, just before we go with that, uh, the other uh, thanks I want to pass on is to, uh, to my wife, Bridget Medill, who's sitting back in the, in the audience tonight. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot that goes on uh, at the home end to be able to put on the, uh, the program for, uh, for the RASC Ottawa Centre, and, uh, and I really counted on, uh, on Bridget's support for that. So thank you, sweetie. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, here we go. So here we go. We got the sound?
822 people tonight. Brian has asked me to close out the meeting so that he can make his dramatic exit at the right time. Um, I seem to recall about over a decade ago, Glenn LeDrew introduced the notion of door prizes at this uh, meeting and in a simple effort to make it fun. And I think every chair since then has done something to make these meetings more interesting, more educational, more fun. Except Brian, I think, who has really raised the bar. Um, unfortunately, that means I have to live up to his standard now. So in honor of him making my life difficult, I would like to present him with this official looking the coveted Golden Toga Award. <laughs> Some of you may remember that Brian occasionally shows up in the toga. And it says, presented to Brian McCulloch on the occasion of completing a superb job as RAC meeting chair and being a hard act to follow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Brian. Okay. Okay. All right, the meeting, is, the meeting is over. However, we've arranged for some post-meeting entertainment for you. Um, in the lobby right now, we have our uh, book library, which is out this door and to the right. We also have the uh, telescope library, see Al Scott. Out in the lobby, we have Conversation, Carbohydrates and Caffeine, hosted by Art and Ann Fraser. Very soon, some people who discover that they need more than caffeine for, for a conversation. They need actual alcohol. We'll go to Kelsey's. We have a reservation there. I think it's under the name of REC. I think so. Did Brian do it? OK. Any case, um, <clears throat> tomorrow night, we'll have the talk by uh, Jamie. And we'll have a, a free star party, even though there's a nominal charge for this talk. I'll be bringing my telescope. This could be a good time to do the, um, the lunar challenge. If it's clear, if it's cloudy, I understand that some people will be setting up telescopes uh, indoors and we'll have a static display to muse, uh, muse people. Um, on the 16th, there's going to be a talk about a painting which apparently has some astronomical symbolism. I have some details here for people who are interested. I note that this is a $135 million painting. I'm not sure that we got it upright in the picture here. <laughs> on the 21st, the museum will have a Soltis star party and they're looking for us to bring some telescopes. Uh, either on the 25th, not 20th, the 26th, 27th, or 28th, that's a typo. Uh, I'll be having observing at uh, my observatory, Worth's Observatory. I'll post a notice at uh, the RC uh, Memlisk. This would be a good time to do some uh, deep sky challenge objects if you're interested. And on uh, January the 9th, that's the second Friday of January, not the first Friday. This is going to give us a little time to recover from, from Christmas overeating. We'll have our next meeting. This is the RAC. The party never ends. Thank <laughs> you.